Yes, welcome everyone. Um, we are uh, stoked to have you with us. Uh, we're going to have this webinar with uh, Oli Kensington, and we're going to talk about, um, or he's going to talk about at least, the Canon imaging ecosystem and uh, um, show the advantages of uh, things like EOS C70 and R5 from a video perspective. So uh, really happy to have him with us and um, yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, my name is Trond Eriksson. I'm uh, working in the Oslo store uh, as a solution expert from video and streaming. Um, but today, the focus is on Canon. Uh, and we at Scandinavian Photo, we love uh, creativity. We love to find the right products and we love, love to help you find the right products to, to help you be more creative. Um, and... Um, we now have stores in Copenhagen in Denmark. We have stores in Sweden, in Budos and Stockholm, and Oslo in Norway, where I'm sitting. So uh, please come and uh, talk to us if you have any uh, needs, if you have any questions. Um, you can contact us in, directly in the store, or you can mail us, or you can uh, go through the website or the phone. It's a lot of ways to get in touch with us. So this week and next week is really special for us because we have Canon Pro Weeks um, where you can come and visit or join us like this on a webinar and learn more about Canon's uh, products like the PTZ line, the Cinema line, the R5, the RF lenses, the printers. There's a lot of topics we're going to cover. Um, so please uh, check the website for which webinars are available and uh, make sure that you're logged on to it those that you find interesting. So during this event, uh, you're free to ask questions. Please do um, use either the chat function or the Q&A function, and uh, we will uh, um, get to the questions at the end of the, the webinar. And you can write in English or you can write in Scandinavian. Either way is, is OK, and we will understand uh, most of the languages, so that should be good. So without any further ado, I'm done talking. Oli, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Trond. Um, thank you very much for hosting me. Thanks to Canon. And um, I wanted to start uh, by talking about the uh, Canon C70, but I'm also going to be talking about the R5 and, and generally across the current lineup of Canon Cinema EOS cameras and mirrorless cameras as well, because they are all very, very useful filmmaking tools. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to jump straight to a keynote presentation just with some slides, which will raise some talking points for me to um, explore around the C70. And um, I'll come back occasionally to me. I'm also going to try and take you into my DaVinci Resolve system as well, just to show a grade that I'm working on at the moment, which has come from the R5. And I'm sure something will go wrong, but hopefully, hopefully not. Uh, as Tron said, please um, uh, feel free to submit questions and we'll uh, do our best and I'll, I'll do my best at the end to answer those as, as we go. So I'm going to attempt now to share my presentation with you. So two seconds and hopefully that will pop up. Let me make sure that I'm in the right screen. And there we go. So hopefully you're now seeing uh, some slides. So let's start off talking about the C70. As I said, I will be coming back and talking about the R5 in some detail as well, but I wanted to start off just focusing on the C70, uh, mostly because that is the current Cinema EOS camera that we own here, that we are using for the bulk of our productions. It is a camera that um, is very surprising in many ways. I was uh, blown away by um, the camera when I got my hands on it for the first time just, just over a year ago. Um, and the main thing I was blown away by was the sensor. It is the same C300 Mark III sensor, the Super 35 sensor with the dual gain output technology that, they, that Canon um, brought to that sensor. And that DGO, what that um, allows you to do is things like this. This is a very simple shot, just a frame grab from uh, a, a bit of B-roll that I was filming for a case study I'm doing actually for Canon UK at the moment. And uh, what is interesting about this particular 
scene and um, the DGO from the sensor in that camera is that this is completely and utterly art um, sorry not artificially naturally lit so there is not even so much as a reflector in use here and uh, you can see that we've got a uh, bright sunshine this is actually a, a glass roofed atrium in an area of a university here in the UK and we shot this back in the uh, beginning of September it was a very bright sunny day and you can see the sun um, streaming in there through this glass roofed um, atrium area um, directly onto uh, our person that we were filming at that time this uh, lovely chap Dan who like me has very little hair on his head and uh, uh, I think it's scientifically proven now that uh, a bold person's head is the shiniest and most reflective object on the planet um, and as such normally causes a lot of issues when filming in direct sunlight like this. Now I should say it does look actually like this is clipping a little bit on on uh, Dan's head. Um, it actually isn't. Uh, this is just, uh, this is ungraded. I haven't, um, it's the last thing I've got to do in post-production on this uh, project. There's a, a couple of frames here, um, but these are ungraded. These, these actually just have the standard Canon Log 2 to 709 LUTs dropped on them at the moment, which is just, um, just where I've been editing them. Um, and that will be taken, that LUT will be taken off and I'll be grading this from scratch um, as the final part of the process before that's delivered so um, it does look like some areas are clipped but I, I can assure you they're actually not uh, at all um, the whole dynamic range of the scene is contained and not just contained because a lot of cameras can contain things using their log curves these days but but what's very interesting about this is it's contained and and very natural looking it looked very much like it looked to my eyes and when you have a sensor that can achieve 16 or more stops of dynamic range, you are starting to get into that territory where you, you almost mimic the response to dynamic range that we have with our eyes, which is to say that it's very natural um, and you don't really think too much um, when you look at a scene like this with your eyes. You don't, you don't struggle to see the, the shadow side of the individual's face. You don't uh, struggle to see their skin detail in the highlight side. And as you can see with the camera here, it's also really not struggling at all. There is no reflection, there's no bounce, there's nothing um, putting light back into the fill side of this uh, uh, individual's face here. This is all simply captured within the normal dynamic range uh, capabilities of the sensor. And that, um, it doesn't seem like much, but when you um, are using, particularly if you're coming from mirrorless or DSLR cameras, uh, which have a, a considerably less dynamic range, um, you suddenly find with proper cinema cameras like these that you have the ability to work more naturally and that actually is really useful for me because I work an awful lot in uh, brand documentaries and although we do corporate work there is very much an overlap between the documentary work we've done and the style uh, and the, the sort of techniques that that um, you would find in documentary which we often bring to the corporate work that we do um, and as such it tends to be fairly small crews fairly hands-off in terms of lighting it's not a highly stylized way of working um, and therefore it's quite nice to be able to um, capture scenes like this where we have sunlight um, uh, bright sun uh, and the opposing shadows that come with that and, and an, a camera that can capture that very very happily which is great we've also got some scenes here this was again part of some b-roll that we were capturing for this particular case study uh, outside again it, it looks like there's some clipping here that there actually isn't at all there's there's nothing uh, if you analyze the image uh, the log uh, image with the LUT off um, there's a, a few pixels a couple that are specular highlights off the back of the cars in the back of the shot but uh, nothing else is and, and we've got here we've got people with light tops in direct sunlight with blonde hair in direct sunlight um, you know highly reflective um, surfaces that would normally cause a lot of issues um, if you were going to turn up with absolutely no way of managing that dynamic range in terms of bringing artificial lighting um, and there is no artificial lighting here this is this is entirely uh, actuality just the camera working and interestingly they're actually using the c300 mark III uh, in the footage here and i'm capturing them with the c70 and those cameras obviously share the same sensor so it's kind of incredible that the c70 has this same sensor in it as a camera considerably more expensive 
It doesn't have the RAW that you have in the C300 Mark III or the full expandability that you have with the form factor of the C300 Mark III and the C500 Mark II, but it, it's an incredibly capable lightweight camera. And all of this stuff, in fact, I think every single one of these shots was, was captured uh, on a gimbal. And that's another great thing about the C70 is how lightweight it is and how easy it is to move from tripod to gimbal. I use the DJI RS2 um, and it's so easy to stick it on uh, and move around really quickly, move back again, very uh, quick to set up. Um, and that's a great sort of benefit of the form factor and the weight of the C70. The other cool thing about the C70 is um, it, it has the same very high quality, to my eye, indistinguishable from the lower frame rates, but very high quality 4K, 120 frames per second. So I can get really nice, uh, crisp, high frame rate footage, which is great for a corporate shooter like me, where we um, often find ourselves having to kind of bring an extra dimension to liven up potentially fairly mundane shots or, or repetitive shots. Um, this is one of my clients, an uh, uh, organisation called the RHS, the Royal Horticultural Society, uh, here in uh, the UK. Um, they've been one of my clients for a couple of years now, and this was a very simple um, uh, video that was uh, put together for their YouTube channel, a series of tips that they've been doing. And I think what's really interesting, particularly at the moment, uh, as things have, have been going over uh, the last year and a half, two years um, nearly, well, I, I've certainly had to work in smaller crews and, and, and often on my own um, just through um, the uh, sort of restrictions that have been put in place. And this project here is a very relevant one in that regard. I had to go and do this entirely on my own. So I had no sound recordist, there's, there's no assistance, there's no one, you know, helping with reflectors or uh, uh, managing with sound. I'm doing all of that on my own. Um, there's a mixture of piece to camera. Um, there's, there's obviously audio, there's dialogue all the way through this. And then a mixture of B-roll. Um, the flexibility of the C70 with its built-in NDs and its, uh, uh, two channel um, or four channel but two input um, mini XLRs uh, it, it's such a crucial thing to be able to flexibly move um, uh, through different scenes different times of day different lighting conditions different frame rates all of these different things while simultaneously recording audio um, all as, as, as a one-man band in this case um, relying on the autofocus system to keep track uh, and keep tight focus on the face uh, it, it's kind of incredible what you can achieve, and it, it doesn't feel like it's you're like you're juggling lots of balls, and and one or two of them is going to get dropped. It actually feels like you're juggling one or two balls, uh, you're juggling uh, multiple balls, and and you're managing to keep all of them in the air quite happily, and you can focus on making a, a good product. And it's lovely when you have the resources and and the money and the time for larger projects. But um, I don't know about you guys listening at home, but certainly me over the last year or so, if I was um, not working um, on these smaller projects just on my own, then I would have been doing nothing at all. So it was great to have the opportunity to um, have a client that could get me uh, to, to do this stuff, but more importantly, that I could say yes, and I could get stuff that was of the same quality that they would expect um, in normal times, but essentially on my own. Uh, I was also using the 24-105RF um, uh, f4 lens, which is uh, one of many fantastic RF lenses. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about those a bit later on, but uh, a really lovely lens for quickly moving and getting a range of shots um, quickly. Uh, again, this is a 4K, 120 frames frame grab uh, from that footage. All really, really sharp, beautiful imagery. Um, this is actually the C70 that we own. This is this is built up how I used it on that particular shoot that you've just seen the frame grabs from. That was uh, captured a few weeks back. Um, very lightweight, very easy. Most of that all captured handheld. You can see you've got top handles, side handles, got an Atomos Shinobi on the top, uh, bright tangerine cage and, and matte box on the front. Very um, capable, flexible package, but but surprisingly light, agile, and, and easy to use. And, and I can slip it out of all of that very quickly, handles off the, using the NATO rails on the top and onto a gimbal um, in, in you know, under a minute very happily. So 
probably the most flexible package in terms of imaging and in terms of weight and uh, how we can rig it that we've we've actually had um, um, and a big step up from the C200 which we had previously. Now the C200 um, obviously shoots raw um, that's one thing that uh, we are essentially missing by moving to the C70 um, and, and if we need raw then then we would hire in say a C300 Mark III or a C500 Mark II um, but we do have raw um, a, a compressed raw but a raw nonetheless um, a raw light with the R5 um, and that's something actually that um, uh, just recently has evolved to the point now where if you pair the R5 with the Atomos Ninja V Plus you can actually capture 8K ProRes RAW um, which is which is mind-blowingly good I have to say um, I'm currently great well I've just finished grading something for uh, Eric Van Vuren who um, shot some uh, some sample 8k raw footage in Rotterdam recently and uh, I've just been grading that uh, ProRes raw stuff for the for the first time from the R5 and it's uh, something very special I have to say um, from a grading point of view it's incredible the way it responds this um, this actually isn't uh, these frame grabs now. These are from the R5, a, a project that I shot earlier this year. And in fact, the uh, these aren't 8K. Um, I love using the R5 in its 4K HQ mode. And what that gives you is a downsampled uh, from the 8K full frame sensor, downsampled to 4K in camera, and gives you this incredibly detailed, beautifully vivid um, image. And uh, this this was a goldsmith who I was capturing, uh, making a wedding band. And uh, the entire um, time that I was um, working uh, working down there and, and filming and capturing what was going on, um, it, it was a very simple setup. Just just one light in, in pretty much all the cases. The rest of it's sort of just incidental light that's coming from flames or various other bits and pieces that are in the workshop there. But the level of detail is, is fairly stunning. And what I'm going to try and do um, is I'm going to try and move across to DaVinci Resolve now. And hopefully, Tron, I don't know if you can interject if it's not worked, but uh, hopefully you're now seeing a frame from DaVinci Resolve. Looks perfectly. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so this is, a, this is actually that, that same project. I just wanted to show you sort of the underbelly of, of this footage from the R5. This is the ungraded uh, 4K HQ um, footage from the R5, um, and, and this is the grade. In fact, those screenshots I just showed you in the keynote, those aren't even the final grades. Um, th this is the final grade that's um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the project, and it is um, an incredibly detailed image. Now, I think this is probably going to be a little bit stuttery over this uh, zoom, but um, this this image, if I just pause it there, to, to my eye, and I've got 4K, um, you know, 55-inch 4K LG OLED uh, client viewing monitor in my color grading suite where I am right now, um, and, and it looks, I mean, I can't overstate this, it's the clarity and the detail of that 4K HQ is just fantastic and it's why i chose the r5 for this particular project because i knew that i was going to be shooting things where there was going to be small details little tiny little bits of interest going on you know, in the hands of the goldsmith like this frame here where i wanted there to be that rich um, detailed image and, and really the r5 just gives one of the nicest and, and most detailed images that i've seen out of any camera i mean it's much sharper and uh and more detailed even than the uh, uh, the C300 Mark III or the, the C70. The only image from the cinema cameras that I've seen that uh, comes close to this or, or maybe matches it is the image from the C500 Mark II with its 6K um, uh, downsampled image, which is also beautifully detailed. But it's um, it's kind of crazy that that you can achieve this from a from a mirrorless camera. So I, I'm absolutely loving um, working with the R5. Um, quite often as a B cam as well. So uh, this this project here, I was shooting um, on my own with single camera, um, but I am increasingly using the R5 as a B cam for interviews, and I'll show you some screen grabs from that in a moment. Uh, but uh, I just thought it'd be useful for you to to see uh, the ungraded, the kind of the the, the negative uh, that that came from the camera uh, versus the um, the grade that's been placed on on these shots, and you know it's. Uh, I think it's 
it's pretty special. It's a pretty special camera, I have to say. Um, so if I flick back, I'm just trying to think if there are any other good shots. I mean, they're all they're all nice to be honest. Uh, I'm really happy with all of it. And again, this is a nice little shot here. All very detailed work. This one's also really nice, actually. Just measuring the ring and the the detail in the metal. Uh, and even like the dirt under his nails and the, the texture of his skin, uh, really, really beautiful. So that was a great project to actually get to, to use with the, um, with the R5. And if I just skip through these, you can see this was just the temporary grade I did whilst I was editing it. So what you've just seen in Resolve is the actual final graded image. Um, and it's very easy to forget, of course, that the R5 is also an incredibly accomplished stills camera. So um, although uh, I, I only really use it for um, uh, for video, have uh, um, taken some stills with it. In fact, we documented the uh, the launch of the iPhone 13 for Apple um, last month in, in London. And um, all all of those stills were captured using the R5. It's just a beautiful image. This is a this is a actually a, a shot that I just took for my own purposes whilst we were filming uh, with the uh, with the R5 um, uh, a while back. So really beautiful um, stills from that camera as well. But as I say, as an AB pairing with the, uh, the using the R5 and uh, the C70 in this case, um, just a fantastic pairing, um, beautifully matched. Uh, colors. These these are pretty much ungraded. There's only some very minor tweaks to the contrast that have taken place here, uh, and that's mostly just because the C70, this angle here, the C70 doesn't have Canon log, um, so the the Cinemaos cameras now don't have log. They they go straight from wide DR to log three and then log two, whereas the R5 um, has uh, Canon log or the original Canon log or log three. Um, so uh, there was a little bit of contrast work um, that, that went on here. But in terms of color matching, you can see these these angles, they just they match really easily. This is more or less straight out of the camera. Um, and it's just nice to be able to shoot interviews with that second uh, camera angle. And, you know, again, there's that detailed, um, really nice uh, look to the R5, which which is which is particularly fantastic to work with. Of course, both of these cameras, they share the same mounts. They're, they're using the RF uh, mount, which is the newer, latest uh, version of uh, Canon's uh, lens mount type. And the RF lens ecosystem is growing rapidly. Um, the, most recently, they've just introduced a new 16, uh, 16 mil um, uh, prime lens, uh, which uh, I'm very keen to get my hands on and have a little play with. But uh, amongst this lot, you can see here, I've, I've got the 35 mil uh, f1.8. In fact, that's the lens I'm using right now on my C70 for this presentation. Um, uh, really one of my favorite RF lenses. It's also one of the cheapest ones. It's macro. It's got image stabilization in it. It's, it's beautifully light, uh, compact lens, but it's very sharp as well, which is nice. But pretty much across the board with all of these new lenses, they're, they're a huge step up, you know, optically, often lighter, smaller, uh, brighter, stabilized, you know, where their EF counterparts weren't. Uh, and I think the 70 to 200 f 2.8 is probably a really good example of that. It's about half the size and weight of the EF equivalent, um, and yet is uh, also got image stabilization in it, which it didn't, it doesn't in the EF version. It's kind of incredible how, how Canon are managing to achieve this with these new lenses. So that's really exciting about, about the R5 and the C70 in particular. Um, also, there's some specific adapters. Um, so this adapter is the 0.71 adapter. Uh, it goes from the RF uh, mount to EF. So it allows you to adapt to EF lenses as you still have them. So I use this with my 16 to 35 f 2.8 EF and my 2470 2.8 um, EF. And, and in both cases, this acts as a speed booster. So it, it actually gives you a full frame um, field of view. So I have, uh, confusingly, I decided to capture a lens whilst demonstrating demonstrating this adapter, which is a little bit meta. But um, this is uh, two shots, one with the 16 to 35 without the adapter and one with the 16 to 35 with the adapter. And you can see two things changing here. Obviously, our field of view going from 16 mil to 11 mil, uh, but also we're getting a stop of light back as well. So we're going from f2.8 to f2 just by using that uh, 0.71 adapter, which is 
which is a, a great thing. And in fact, you can even screw that adapter permanently to the body uh, for extra stability. And if you're always going to use it and only own uh, EF um, glass, then, then that's a, a really useful thing as well. So um, a, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic um, uh, addition, if you like, to the, to the C70. In terms of the R5, another adapter that I would recommend specifically for the mirrorless cameras is this, the, uh, the drop-in filter um, uh, RF to EF. Uh, with the drop-in Very ND, it's fantastic. It enables you to maintain your aperture. Um, and because of the amazing autofocus system on the R5, um, it, it's, it's really nice to be able to actually use the widest part of the lens. Uh, really nice, deep, sh you know, uh, very shallow depth of field uh, and still have rock steady um, focus with the uh, autofocus system. And the Vary ND will allow you to achieve that by um, uh, obviously allow allowing you to adjust your exposure using the variable ND inside, which is a very compact, neat solution and allows you to carry on uh, you know, changing lenses uh, uh, and carrying on working normally without having to constantly unscrew and rescrew those filters back on again, which is, which is a very neat feature. So um, those uh, uh, um, C70 and R5 um, slides. If I just come back to uh, my Zoom, let's stop sharing that, and hopefully I should be back in the room with you here. Um, those slides just sort of illustrate some of the things that I like most about uh, uh, those particular cameras. But there's one big overarching theme with these cameras, and in fact, all of Canon's Cinema EOS range and mirrorless cameras at the moment, which is a, a real focus by Canon on consistency of output. And I touched on it there when I was talking about using the R5 as a B cam to the C70. But in fact, that's true of all the cameras. So I've used the C70, for example, as a B cam to a C500 Mark II recently. Uh, and both were using the Canon Sumire uh, Prime uh, cine lenses on there. Um, using on the C500 Mark II, you can just um, adapt the mount. So we just took off the EF mount and put on an L, uh, a PL mount uh, and put it on that way. But even with the C70, because it's using the RF mount with its uh, very, very shallow flange distance, it's infinitely adaptable. So I was in fact using the, I think it was the Metabones RF to PL adapter uh, in order to also use the Sumeres on the C70. And that pairing uh, worked really well. I mean, that was a, that was a really nice um, project that we, that we did recently with those two. But it kind of doesn't matter which Cinema EOS camera you reach for. You can spec up a, a shoot and you can hire in or, uh, or buy if you own um, any particular camera in that Cinema EOS range uh, and their most recent mirrorless cameras, or pretty much all the mirrorless cameras in fact, and you can be almost guaranteed of a simple post workflow in terms of color management. And a lot of that comes down to the color matrix that's being used. And so I think for about three or maybe four years now, um, the default color matrix that Canon have been implementing on mirrorless and Cinema EOS cameras is uh, what they call their neutral color matrix. And it does two things incredibly well. The first is it matches across the range. So any of the Canon uh, cameras that use that neutral color matrix, if you assuming you white balance them both, obviously, if they're not white balanced the same, then, then that will obviously cause differences in color. But assuming they're white balanced can, uh, uh, the same between them, the color um, reproducibility and the consistency across the cameras when they're using that neutral color matrix is just incredible. I, I haven't seen a consistency across multiple models of camera from the same manufacturer quite like that um, before and, and such a wide range. I mean, we're talking the EOS R, R5, R6, R3, 1DX Mark III, uh, C200, C70, C300 Mark III, uh, C500 uh, Mark II. There's a whole host of newer cameras that have come out in the last few years that are using this um, neutral color matrix. And, and as I say, the, the first and most important thing for me is that consistency. So I can use them in multicam shoots. Uh, I, I also just know what to expect um, when I get that footage back from those cameras. The other um, very big thing is that it is incredibly good at faithfully capturing uh, and uh, rendering the colors of the world around us. And, and a very good way of testing that and demonstrating that is to shoot charts. Um, I use the X-Ray color checker video charts. And if uh, on those charts, you have the uh, saturated 
chromaticity references for Rec 7 and 9. So you have the red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, and yellow um, uh, chips, and they should, in a Rec 7 and 9 calibrated video system, they should fall in very specific places on a vector scope. And I've done this test time and time again over the years with various cameras that I've owned or have tried other cameras and the Canons are always consistently uh, accurate but the most recent cameras with the neutral color matrix and, and particularly this latest generation of Cinema EOS they by quite some margin come s sort of very very close if not spot on to where these chromaticity references should land in a vector scope which which goes to show the canon have thought carefully and engineered these cameras carefully um, to be very color accurate and faithful um, and although you may want to do something quite drastic in the grade you know that that uh, wedding ring stuff I just showed you. I've got color compressors on there pulling, you know, pretty much anything that's sort of between yellow and magenta, pulling those round uh, into a specific place and then pulling all the blues round. And, you know, I've done some pretty major work on, on the colors particularly yeah, in that, but it doesn't matter if you're going off quite drastically with your grade afterwards. Any colorist will tell you that what you want initially is you want to build the project up to a technically balanced starting point so that you can focus on consistency, contrast, before you then start to move off and build your look, which you can then do on a scene by scene or holistically across the whole film if you want to, a little bit like you might do with an adjustment layer. Um, and what helps enormously is having a, a Canon, uh, Canon's ecosystem of cinema cameras essentially giving you footage straight from the camera, which is already almost perfectly technically balanced. And it allows for a speed of post workflow that um, is either a, a, a very good thing if you just need to turn things around quickly, or B, a very good thing if you just want to spend the time you've got allotted to the grade, for example, spending that time working creatively instead of correctively. So not wasting time trying to fix problems, trying to match cameras. And, and I've experienced that myself with other manufacturers' cameras, even current cameras within their current range, where the, the colors just don't match. They don't look the same between the, the different cameras in their own range. And so I really appreciate the, the focus that Canon bring to that um, consistency and to the, um, the look and feel of, of each of those different cameras. And that they've thought that someone will want to still have that even with a mirrorless camera where they might be using those video features uh, as a B camera or as a supporting camera to part of a larger production with the cinema cameras. That's, uh, you know, again, that shows a commitment by Canon to, to the filmmaker that that's using these various tools for various purposes, which is, you know, I think uh, something that sometimes people in the past I've heard of accused Canon of not thinking about. And I think this is one of the areas where actually you, you can see it's demonstrably true that they are really thinking about those use cases and, and those types of, uh, of customers, which is great. So um, a whole host of, of, of projects that I've been working with. I'm going to try now, I'm going to flip back to Resolve, and I'm just going to try now and work up a quick grade on uh, another shot. So if you just bear with me two seconds, I'm just going to uh, flick back again. Hopefully this, uh, hopefully this works. And let's see. Oh, hello. Don't beep at me. No, it's not beeping at me. Good. Um, if I bring in a simple shot here let me come into my drive and we should oh no not that one here we go yeah so i'm just going to bring in it's a shot that i showed you earlier in fact which is is it going to appear on the screen? It should do. Oh, it's, it's running slow today. It simply doesn't appreciate, appreciate doing so much at the same time. Sorry, my system is taking a while. There we go. Let's grab a little section of this. And what I'll show you, this, so this is the same frame that um, I was uh, demonstrating earlier. And, and what I'm going to do so I'm just going to take a small section of this and actually work this up. So you um, you saw 
here we go. Let's just grab this bit here. You saw earlier the the LUTID image, so the the sort of the um, the image from the edit, in fact, so not not anything that had been worked up. Um, this is the uh, camera file straight from the camera, and I just wanted to show you what exactly what I was talking about before. So we've got areas here where we've got sunlight, you know, for example, just falling on. Uh, blonde hair, which is of, often very uh, liable to clip. Um, we've got um, various different sort of uh, highly reflected, there's some specular highlights on the back of a silver car that's in the background there. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is actually show you the scopes for this image. In fact, let's just hide this. There we go. So hopefully you can see here the actual scope. So if you look carefully, we you can cannot see, see the scopes right now. You can't. Sorry, did you say? Uh, no, we're seeing the uh, user interface. We're not seeing the scope. Oh, that is not good. Why have you done that to me? You... Hang on, let me go back into here. And let me just try that again. That's weird. It did before. Um, maybe if I... Let me try doing it this way. Can you see it now, Trond? Yes, now we're seeing the scopes. Okay, fantastic. So um, the the scopes here show us, we've got our, uh, this is C-Log2, so we can see our raised um, shadow point, um, our, our blacks are uh, elevated up here. And we've also got, obviously, our clipping point. Now, the clipping point with the C-Log2 drops to about 90 IRE, and you can see we've got these things that are uh, nice and safe. There's a couple of little uh, specular highlights. I think that little blip just there, that's actually that. Uh, reflection of the car in the background but um, you know these are these are pixels these are tiny little pixels within the image the, the vast majority of uh, and certainly everything that's interesting and relevant within this uh, image is nice and safely uh, contained within uh, the dynamic range capabilities of the sensor and if I just grade this shot quickly so I'm just going to uh, bring our shadows down get our highlights back up let's just work on the contrast a little bit here and let's bring up our saturation touch as well and if i flick back to my davinci resolve screen hopefully you can see that shot now there just with uh you know there's not a huge amount going on there just just a, a very simple grey popped on this, just a little bit of colour work. It's a bit green. Let's warm it up a bit as well. And let's just tweak this a little bit. So there you go. Very simple little grade. But what's so beautiful about the, the files from this is they're really detailed in terms of colour reproduction uh, from the C70, but it's putting it into an XFABC 10-bit 42 codec. Um, so we've got an, an awful lot of um, uh, color information. Um, we can uh, balance things from that very flat log, C log 2 profile, um, um, but we can still um, bring back anything that we need very easily um, without having to worry. Uh, with, without having to worry about pushing things too far or, um, you know, saturated noise. You know, you're looking at the fairly, uh, I don't think if I zoom in here, I don't think it happens on my actual zoom interface. But even if I do zoom in uh, into a dark area of, of shadow, um, there's there's no creeping noise. Let's see if I can do it. Um, I don't think I can do it on my output, unfortunately. It, it will only do it within the interface itself. But um, there is, uh, you'll have to take my word for it, there is no noise uh, in these shadow areas at all. There's, there's no color, there's no sort of creeping uh, granular um, type noise. Uh, it's a very um, clean image. And as I say, if I want to do something particularly kind of crazy with this in terms of the grade, there's, there's no reason why um, uh, I can't continue to build on this uh, afterwards. So, you know, I might choose to do something a little bit crazy with the with the greens and uh, you know I could bring those greens right round um, and I could bring some of these uh, other colors uh, make a little bit more of 
uh, the color differences between them. Uh, I can move all of that around very happily um, without having to worry about the image falling to pieces uh, or not having enough range uh, within there. It's a very um, color rich uh, image that we're getting from it. So like I said before, if you are starting from a place where you've got a camera that can faithfully capture uh, the environment with which it's it's placed in and and by that uh, i don't just mean the color reproduction that we're focusing on here but just coming back to where i started the the luminance the contrast um, uh, capture of this camera with its dynamic range you, you end up with this um, really fantastically useful position where you've got a camera that's essentially making you be able to start very quickly. You know, I, I've got a starting point for that grade in, well, you saw me doing it in live in front of you, 20 seconds, something like that. And I can start from there and build really quickly. Um, when I compare that to how a lot of people work, and, and I've seen a lot of people with, I won't name specific cameras, but there are, you know, cameras that are very prevalent out in the market, used an awful lot by um, self shooters and, and freelance cam ops, uh, particularly in, in the UK. Um, where um, the, no the noise in the image is quite um, prevalent, the noise floor is quite high, and the, the camera manufacturer themselves recommend that you overexpose that camera to kind of raise the image up out of that noise floor. Um, what they don't tell you is that then moves pretty much everything in the image, obviously, up into the more compressed part of the log gamma curve, and so you end up with particularly faces being in the higher part and the more compressed part of the gamma, which means when you then dra drop a LUT on it, the LUT's useless because obviously the whole image is a stop and a half or whatever too bright so you then start working back underneath it and even if you don't use the LUTs and you start from scratch you often find that faces end up looking a bit plastic and they lack tonality because they were overexposed and pushed up into the more compressed part of the gamma so it becomes really difficult actually to to just get those images to a starting point um, and even when you do get there you'll find they're quite noisy there's not a huge amount of color information and colors seem sort of plotted inaccurately from where they should be even basic sort of memory colors like foliage and things can just look uh, not quite right and so from a coloring point of view to have a, a, an image delivered out of the camera where all i have to do is think how dynamic is my scene if it's really dynamic something like this c log 2 if it's uh, got uh, less shadows and, and there's less information in the shadows and it's just bright i can use c log 3 uh, if it's fairly low dynamic range maybe sort of 11 or 12 stops of dynamic range then the wide dr gamma is perfect for that and it doesn't actually require any grading it's just a rec 709 um, from mid middle gray down and then from middle gray up you've got a nice roll off that's applied uh, that brings down your highlights and gives you a, a really nice sort of almost hybrid look uh, in terms of the gamma so the camera itself gives me so many options but it makes them simple it's a simple choice based on the dynamic range of the scene uh, 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 and then just capturing it basically you just you just shoot as long as you're white balancing the camera correctly um, you should actually get something like this where it does only take seconds to get a really good well-balanced image and if stuff's coming in from other cinema eos cameras or other canon cameras that are shooting at the same time because of that neutral color matrix you're having to do the same very little work to actually get multiple angles of the same footage looking consistent and uh, that's a that may be a a mundane and fairly low on your list of reasons why you might choose a particular camera but I'm sure that uh, uh, if it's not high on your list of priorities, once you actually have shot and you get back here, <laughs> back in your post suite, uh, then is when that really starts to bite and you start to lose hours of time and never feel 100% happy with the, the image that you've been given. And I think for me, that's where Canon's uh, whole ecosystem of cameras really, really shine. So um, let's have a quick look if I can see um any questions that may have come in um i'm just going to quickly read through do you want to do you want to fill trond whilst i just read some of these questions uh oh so we've got someone asking about um uh, so um trond, if you, you yeah can you hear me sorry mate your, your video is yeah. frozen and i i worried that you would you'd vanish yeah. for a minute i don't know what's happened i'll try to switch it off and on and see Nope, it's acting. Okay, as long as you okay. can hear me, that's yeah. important. I can hear you fine. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So the uh, your presentation, you had a picture with a, a bee and a flower. It's one of the first pictures yes. with that combination. Yeah. There was a question: What kind of lens you shot that with? Yeah. So that um, that was on a gimbal, and uh, when I'm on the the gimbal, one of the lenses I like to use quite often, just because it's so lightweight, uh, and I referred to it a bit later, is that 35 mil. Um, f 1.8 rf and in fact that's the lens i'm i'm using right now it's um i like 35 mil as a focal length it's a really nice focal length it's good for uh, general work um uh, and on a gimbal i quite like having that just slightly longer i get a bit bored of always seeing the sort of the same 24 16 mil kind of wide angle gimbal shots so um i, I like to use that 35 mil on on those shots but one of the cool things about that lens is that it's very sharp um, so it's a lovely portrait lens I have to say it's uh, as a kind of a slightly wide portrait it's it's beautiful um, I also that 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 particular frame was that lens but um, I also use quite a lot the uh, 50 mil f 1.2 rf um, and that again is a very special lens uh, really beautiful much bigger and heavier and more expensive um, but you, there's a lot of the qualities that you get from that 35mm 1.8 you get, and, and, and it's a big step up in, in other regards. So you're at 1.2. Um, and because of the autofocus being so good on these cameras, I I will almost always use those that 50mm at 1.2. Um, and I think that that um, when I was going through the, the A and B cams for those interviews, um, the R5B cam in each of those scenarios was using that 50mm 1.2 at 1.2. Um, and I think uh, if you remember, I, I can call them up again if, if people want to see them again. But um, if you remember, those B angles from the R5 were, I think, actually really, really nice, really lovely images. Good. So then the you probably basically answered the next question, which was what kind of lenses would you recommend to the R5 when filming interviews and presentations on stage? Um, well, interviews, I think that 35mm 1.8 and the 50mm 1.2 are great. The 85mm 1.2 is an incredible lens as well. Um, but all, you know, apart from the 35mm, you know, those are quite expensive, the 50 and the 85 I'll tell you one that I am finding really useful, but it's not quite so flexible in terms of its um, f-stop, is the... Um, uh, 24 to 105 f4 it's very lightweight um, it's a good flexible zoom range uh, it's very sharp um, and a lot of that that stuff like the close-ups of the sweet corn and, and all that rhs stuff that was all shot with that lens just that one lens because it was very quick we had an hour to get all of that and i've used that uh i don't often shoot presentations but um i did by coincidence shoot one recently which was the agm uh for the rhs actually um and uh, I use that lens. Um, it's great, you know, back of the room, good, good, um, flexible uh, um, focal length on that. Um, so I think I think all of those would be suitable for that type of scenario. There is the twenty-eight to seventy f two, um, but I think that that's more use as a photo lens. I think for the for the R five rather than a. A video lens although you know it would be good for interviews but it's huge and it's very heavy so you, you probably need to support it in some way i think okay someone's great someone's saying here about the 4k output on the c70 and the r5 are not right. exactly the same i'm not entirely certain in which in what specific regard they mean okay so we'll go on to the next one then uh which computer are you editing on and do you need to make proxies for the r5 or the c70 very good question and you're going to get an honest answer. <laughs> so um, I have been, for the past year, I've uh, been using the C70 uh, and the R5, and I have been struggling a little bit and having to create proxies on this machine, this system here. Um, this is a Mac Pro, so the big, uh, the latest sort of uh, Apple tower. Um, it's got a 32 gigabyte GPU in it um, the whole system is is was very expensive and was uh, incredibly powerful and uh, uh, and can cope with huge you know uh, grades that we were doing and then i started using those cameras and i couldn't understand why uh, these relatively inexpensive simple camera codecs with no grade on them and nothing were actually dropping frames so much when when i was playing them back that i um, needed to create proxies um, 
And it turns out that it is the processor. So the Intel processors that um, are currently available in the Mac Pro, they have no H.265 um, uh, encoding or decoding acceleration um, built into them. And so any of those very computationally difficult um, files that are derived from HEVC from H.265, which the latest codecs are on those Canon cameras, um, they are very taxing on the on the CPU, on the Intel CPUs. Now, I had heard that Apple's new M1 processors um, were had H.265 uh, um, acceleration built into them or handled it much better. And so as an experiment, I recently bought a couple of months ago a, a Mac Mini, an M1 Mac Mini, um, for a twelfth of the cost. <laughs> so it was it was a grand, and our Mac Pro system cost twelve thousand um, pounds. So a, a fraction of the cost. And um, if I take the same project and edit it on the Mac Mini, it absolutely flies through. It doesn't drop any frames. We don't have any proxies. Don't even have to lower the 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 resolution dynamically whilst it's playing back i can watch it uh, full quality edit jknl back and forth with no hesitation whatsoever um and um you know that doesn't that doesn't even have a dedicated graphics card so clearly it's it's a cpu issue um with with intel's uh, um, processors um if you've if you're using a pc and you're using premiere um i would just recommend specking up um, uh, the most recent processors that you can and try and get uh, ones um, that have uh, hevc uh, um, integrated hevc um, acceleration uh, what I'm uh, planning on doing as soon as possible is, is upgrading my uh, workstation with uh, M1X, uh, uh, M M1 X Max, I think uh, Apple call their, their most recent sort of high-end processor. Um, I'm already replacing my 16-inch MacBook Pro. I've got on order one of the M1 Max 16-inch uh, MacBook Pros to replace that. So it's an odd time right now um, where a laptop is going to outperform a much more expensive desktop uh, in these certain situations. But um, uh, yeah, it, I, I told you it'd be the honest answer. Um, uh, it, it is difficult potentially depending on what type of cpu that person has right now but it's the future and it's the way everyone's going so it's uh, it's here to stay so if your computer can't handle it then i would suggest that as soon as you can you uh, you upgrade it yeah so that also answers the next question about the m1 max pro chip so that's good yeah we got yeah. that covered um which other lens do work on the c70 when mounted on the rs2 um so uh, this is one of the reasons I want to try out the new 16 mil that they've just recently announced, because um, that also is is small and lightweight um, uh, compared to, you know, in the similar way the 35 mil is. In fact, it looks like it's even smaller and lighter. So that would be really good for gimbal use if you want wide stuff. Um, 35 works really well. I have used the 24105 on it. Um, and with the RS2, the motors are so strong that if it's well balanced um, with the lens in, at uh, 24 mil, I found that you can zoom in and it doesn't throw it off. The motors don't start shaking or anything. So you can actually use that and have a quite a nice flexible uh, zoom range uh, on, on your shots if you wanted to. Um, but yeah, I tend to stick to what I know works with those shots. So I've tried uh, all of those lenses um, uh, that I've mentioned, but I haven't um, used anything heavier. Uh, the RS2 is a, a very capable gimbal, and I'm sure it could um, handle um, much heavier lenses. I've just not bothered rebalancing the whole thing for those heavier lenses because I have lighter RF versions that work. But in theory, the 16 to 35 EF um, would balance perfectly well. It's a heavier lens, but it's not so heavy that I should imagine it would cause any issues for um, the RS2. Um, so yeah, you, you should be should be fine with most things with that. Um, this is why I got the RS2 and not the the smaller, um, is, it, is it the R2? I think that whatever the smaller one is, um, because I knew the RS2 would be able to cope with a more flexible range of, of lenses attached. Perfect. So uh, last question so far, do you see any need for recording to ProRes uh, or recording ProRes to an Ninja V if uh, with any of these cameras? 
Uh, no, I don't see the need, and I don't, um, as a general rule. Um, there are a few exceptions. So um, if I wanted, um, with the new latest updates with the Ninja V, uh, the Ninja V and the Ninja V Plus, so interestingly, the Ninja V Plus will allow you, with the latest firmware and uh, on the R5, to capture 8K ProRes RAW. Um, but um, what a lot of people don't necessarily realize is if you have the older Ninja V, you can, if I'm reading the spec right, you can ha record a cropped 5K ProRes RAW, um, even with that older Ninja V, not the V Plus from the R5. So that that's quite cool. So if you wanted, um, you know, essentially RAW um, uh, from... Uh, your R5, then you could use a Ninja V or a V Plus for the full 8K. Um, I just just in terms of normal ProRes, I don't, you know, there are. I mean, this has been tried and tested many times over and over and over for for years now. But uh, you are going to see um, less color artifacting. You are going to have a more uh, data rich file if you if you capture uh, in ProRes 42HQ, for example, over an internal codec. Most internal codecs are are a, a lower data rate than you're going to have with those codecs. Do I feel therefore that it's necessary? No, uh, because when I shoot with the internal codecs and look at them on a 55 inch OLED screen, they look really good. So there's a point where you know, and I say this from as a colorist, there's a point where it really you are not going to see huge benefits. There are benefits, but you're not going to see huge benefits for the more complex setup, the more conflict, complex workflow, the additional costs of media um, and post-production time and all of those other sorts of things. Having said that, if there's a particular project you're working on where you need the utmost quality and you need the highest um, data rate uh, that you can get, and so maybe you're doing something particularly extreme in post or visual effects work or something, then absolutely, why not? Why not record it as, as high a quality as you can? But uh, um, certainly, just generally, I don't see a need to, to do that. Um, no. And so I quite often use our Shinobi, um, as you saw in that, that behind the scenes image, I quite often use the Shinobi um, because I don't need the recording most of the time. And uh, uh, so the, my Ninja V will stay uh, in, in the bag and I'll just use the lighter um, Shinobi that the runtime with the same battery is considerably longer and it's a more lightweight setup. So that's just how I work though. Good. So then there is a question uh, regarding DaVinci and Adobe Premiere. Which okay. would you say is easier to learn and, and to uh, start getting into? Um, I would say they're probably about as hard as each other to learn. If you're starting from scratch with on both platforms, I'd say they're probably it's probably similar level learning curve. Um, uh, Premiere, uh, the color tools in Premiere, and particularly the scopes, are just shockingly bad. Um, the tools are okay, um, but they they seem to be all of the Lumetri color panels more or less laid out the way that a someone who's used to tweaking color of stills um, uh, would would do. So um, you know they're not really laid out in a way that's very um, video friendly, I would say. And the scopes are really low quality. They're, they're not reading the the signal off the off the card at a particularly high resolution. So they they look you know it's a, I find it very difficult to to get a detailed assessment of the of the image using the scopes in Premiere. So. Um, I would say if you're starting from the same place, then, then learn to grade in Resolve. Um, you know, it, it's a, to my mind, uh, an infinitely better color package. It's, um, you know, I, I I would say it's better um, in lots of ways, even in the edit in the in the in the editing side of things. You know, forgetting the color side of things, um, but it, it just depends what you're used to. I know lots of After Effects people that aren't particularly uh, keen to move to across to Fusion, but I know loads of people that don't know After Effects um, that are really happy that using Fusion uh, for, for effects work and having it all within one piece of software um, works really well. And of course, um, Resolve, you can use very happily um, in most circumstances just with the free version as well. So um, yeah, there's fairly compelling um, reasons there, but uh, I actually edit with Final Cut Pro 10, and we I often grade. In fact, a lot of that stuff you would have seen um, um, from the final kind of stuff, I, I grade in Final Cut Pro 10 because as a colorist, in my color suite, which is here, if uh, a client has paid me to grade it, I will grade it fully with our full color suite here in DaVinci Resolve. But 
I obviously also run a corporate film production company. So I, I run three companies, in fact. So for Coro Films, um, the client isn't paying me to, to to grade it per se. They're paying for a final film. Um, so we will shoot, and, you know, produce and shoot and edit and deliver that project. And for ease of workflow, we would grade that in Final Cut Pro, which has really you know decent color tools. They're nowhere near as good as Resolve, but they're good enough. Um, and uh, uh, we would um, finish and deliver that in Final Cut Pro. Um, the scopes are really good in Final Cut Pro as well. Um, uh, so. You no, know, I don't think it really matters what you use as long as you are, are comfortable. But if you are starting from 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 absolutely nothing, then I'd say probably it's worth learning Resolve first and foremost. Yeah, great. Um, so a uh, technical question. If you need to shoot a presentation with a screen beside the person talking, what kind of screen is most suitable? Um, so kind of like this, but the screen would be next to the presenter, I presume, and, and in yeah. vision. I, I guess that's what they sound like they're talking about. Um, so that's a, as a, as a difficult question to answer, but I'm going to say um, a screen that has a, a, a that doesn't um, so cheaper screens I've noticed tend to refresh at 60 hertz, and so they they uh, they flicker if you're filming in a 25 frames per second. So um, on the Canons, you have clear scan mode, and you can actually uh, incrementally adjust the shutter speed to get rid of any kind of flicker or things like that. Um, so you can work that way. But if if you're thinking of purchasing a screen to use, I would say um, um, something that uh, has a, a decent high refresh rate, flexible refresh rates that you can make sure is is operating at 50 hertz. Uh, that way on camera, it won't be flickering or anything like that. Um, and probably something with quite decent deep blacks because otherwise they tend to appear very lifted on on video. So probably something like an OLED or something if, if you have the money and, and, and the option. But um, yeah, it's a tricky one to answer that one. And maybe also a matte surface so that it doesn't get Yeah, yeah, if it's got a textured or, or some kind of matte um, uh, screen, that would, that would be great. Yeah. In fact, why not, why not get the Apple 6K uh, Pro Display XDR with the nano-etched matte finish? There you go. It's only £5,000. <laughs> and then, uh, you, you know, you don't even need the stand. You can just hold it. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Okay. That was all the questions. Um, we really appreciate everyone coming and joining us. It's been interesting. Thank you a lot, Oli, for your presentation. It's been Pleasure. informative and, and good. So um, that's it. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for joining us. Please uh, check our websites for future events and uh, join us there. Thank you. Cheers, Trond. Bye-bye.